as your buildings get bigger, the, the risks just, just elevate like you wouldn't believe. Episode 151. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with Doug Johnson, director and founder of Mesh Energy, an independent renewable energy consultant firm aiming to radically improve the chances of sustainable building project success. Doug is the first Meshling, a chartered mechanical engineer, author, and has over a decade of experience in the sustainable design and delivery of low energy buildings. Having initially started in the high-end bespoke home market, Doug's experience now covers projects from £250,000 to £20 million across a wide range of building sectors. In this episode, we discuss the services Mesh Energy offers and how they contribute and enhance the architectural vision. We also discuss the future of sustainable design and how an integrated approach can keep risks down and make for a more robust and effective implementation. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Doug Johnson. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Doug, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? Yeah, very well. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, great to be uh, great to be speaking with you on this one. Excellent, excellent. So you are the founder of Mesh Energy, which is an independent, um, innovative, sustainable energy service where you consult with property owners and architects. And how would you describe what it is that, the, that Mesh does? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, now, that, now that more kind of terminology or, or, or different kind of names are coming up, we kind of change every day of the week what, uh, what we call ourselves. But I, I think where we're, where we're happiest is, is being called independent um, renewable energy consultants. Mm. Uh, and as we'll probably go on to discuss, we, you know, we kind of cover full full gamut of, of services from, you know, across all kinds of different stages of projects, but very much the business attempts to partner with architects and design professionals to make sustainable building more successful. How, really, in a nutshell, that is what we do. And, and how, did, how did that series of services kind of emerge? Very organically, actually. Um, you know, when, when I started the business out, uh, I, I had uh, I got into the renewable energy um, kind of sector in, in about 2008. When I decided to go out on my own in 2013, um, it was very much you know I didn't have a lot of skills. I had a lot of experience, and and I very much approached architects talking about if I could enlighten them as to the alternatives to gas and oil, for example. So one of the very first things that we did was writing a report um, to, to say you know, understand what the, the energy usage of a building was and saying, compared to gas, this is what a heat pump might cost you. Here are the government subsidies for a heat pump, you know, is biomass appropriate? And a very, very kind of distinctive, um, small report in, in, in that sense. And as we talked to architects about what their issues were, we started bolting on more and more services and, and joining up to, to, to make that kind of customer journey more fulfilling for, for everybody. And and what are the sorts of service offerings that you provide to architects, or how how do you how do you work with an architect in order for them to to deliver a project? Okay, so I mean the way that we work with an architect is more often than not contractually we work directly with the client. So the client is paying our bills, um, you know, a bit like you would do most other consultants in in a design team. You know, we, we don't we don't get our money through the architects we work directly with the client and the architect kind of hangs all these consultants together but when when we're talking about working um we increasingly encourage that architects make us a, a key part of the design team as as early stage as possible so if we're talking about the reba stages really you know kind of early stages of, of stage two which is kind of conceptual design there right um, historically we came in after they got planning permission you know and you were entering into detailed design 
but it's it's becoming obvious that sustainable projects are more successful and architects can get more out of their designs if we get involved in those very very early stages and and, and start tapering tapering up our you know fees and involvement as as you go on but you, but you must start at those earlier stages to get to get most from the design process right so so not coming in right towards kind of construction documentation stage and like right we need to figure no, out no 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 there's been some real horror stories and we we still you know we still have architects approaching us and saying look we've done all this amazing work now we just need the sustainability bit <laughs> nailing down and you know they're hoping for a kind of a tick box exercise you know a couple of team meetings and, and a bit of a tickle of the design and it's all sorted um, but that's that's quite an archaic way of thinking and, and certainly a, a much higher risk way of thinking so paradoxically to, to reduce the risk um, we, we're we're working more successfully with architects at, at far far earlier stages than they've ever uh, imagined um, previously and, and getting better results and, and how did you start the business what was the story that came up with the um, that's origin, a, that's, if you like that's a good question a, a frustration probably like a lot of entrepreneurs really um, it was frustration with being managed and being told what to do by incompetent individuals that you you, you firmly believe that they did know what they were talking about and I um, I, I was an engineer. I qualified as an engineer. I did a, a few years working for a very, very big company doing mechanical engineering stuff. But, uh, but uh, I had a real interest in kind of renewable technology um, through, through university and uh, I wanted to do kind of something on my own. But when I, when I started, I actually did a, a very, very short stint in, in Canada. I, I did nine months with the, this uh, company that did like kind of solar farms, turning farmers fields into electricity production places and and that's where it all that that was the final straw you know I was, I was treated so poorly as, a, as an employee and I had this, this huge amount of information I realized that the domestic market and particularly you know those smaller architects practices um, you know we did it really needed a, a, a big, big help um, just trying to as I say make projects more successful there was a lot of passion and enthusiasm particularly from more wealthy clients mm-hmm. projects were falling apart and it was so unnecessary so I actually I actually started with a with a laptop and a and a desk in a in a mouldy spare room in my girlfriend's flat, <laughs> and you know, and the uh, and 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 a very very famous internet search engine was my first kind of port of call. Right. And I just started googling architects. So you know, I kind of knew that I had this information, and I was just looking for architects who just sh- were showing those first signs of doing something other than oil and gas and and the cr- kind of traditional stuff. And, and, and that's where I got my first foot in the door. And, and that was 2013. Got it. So, so you were literally you were finding architects online and then you were making contact with them and they were becoming I clients. was talking to whoever would listen to me. And I started, I lived in very near Farnham at the time. And Farnham is a, is a, is a half decent and a half, a half well-known town. And that's where yeah. we are now. And so I just started working concentric circles of towns around. <laughs> it was, um, you know, that, that was the logic behind it. But, but it's... It, there, there was method to the madness because I knew particularly in, in, in you know, for kind of high end residential properties, you can't go door knocking. You're not going to go leaflet dropping on, on, on people's houses of that kind of um, size. So I, I knew that architects, if I could communicate properly with the architects, they could truly understand how much easier their life would be for something that was definitely coming on down the line. They could learn something. They would then introduce me to, their portfolio of, of clients. So the architects were the, were the kind of the nodes. They're, they're massively trusted by their clientele. Um, yes. And that's, and that's what I was targeting. I, it was a lot about education. And, and, and again, hopefully we'll, we'll talk about a bit, a bit about education going forward. But I knew that was the most effective way of using every single hour of my day. Right. Build relationships with architects. Got it. Got it. And how, how has the, how has your methods today changed in terms of how you go about finding work as you, do you have now quite a, a well-established network of of architects and other businesses that you've consulted with where yeah we yeah we do do i mean it has it has changed i, I i've moved from you know a kind of a one-man band in office typing away or as i say on an internet search engine and, and bashing the phones every single day to somebody who's helping the rest of my team uh, to, to to reach out in in, in more I, I guess kind of in, ingenious and, and helpful ways. So mm. we 
our method of our method of finding architects is very still very much the same. Um, educate, you know, freely give information. Uh, don't start the clock running, and you know, the hourly bill from from the first moment you speak to them. Just build those relationships up. And as I say, we do that in a different way now. So historically, I, I would try and get them get them on the phone, but because of the marketing and, and the webinars and, and the other information that we share very, very freely, you know, we get a lot more inbound inquiries now and, and we don't have to, dare I say, try as hard um, to, to, to bash the phones to find new people because we've got more voices and more articles and more blogs and, you know, more webinar material out there. Um, but, but still, you know, the, the, the principle hasn't changed. Yeah. Help, help architects to understand what the opportunity is. We explain what we do and what we don't do. And then it, it's for our, our, our clients or our, our strategic partners to, to figure out if that, that match is, is right. Got it. Got it. You, you were saying earlier about education and is your, what, what do you mean by that? So f- again, once I, once I understood that architects needed educating, you know, architects have so much to do, you know, architects are, architects are asked to do the most ridiculous things by their clients. <laughs> Not forgetting that these are these are generally creative individuals that aren't project managers. They're not, you know, they they don't know every single thing about renewable energy. So understanding that there's this big kind of burden for architects, um, we and and we knew that we could successfully partner and take a lot of that load of of sustainable design. As I say, working in partnership, but but doing a lot of the thinking and taking a lot of that hard work away from them. I realized that that picking up the phone was was one way to get in front of architects. But again, in order to leverage our time, we understood that continual professional development and these kind of lunchtime sessions, historically, you know, a year ago, there used to be a lot of lunchtime sessions where you would go into a practice, you know, get around the table, have some lunch, and, and they would spend half an hour, 45 minutes learning. And that was, uh, we did that from the very, very early, early mm. stage. And that was so successful. Our conversion rate of talking to architects and then actually them getting plans out at the end of the session or getting in touch with us within a few months of having done that was was incredible. It was like 40% conversion rate. It was it was mad. Right. And and I can pin that directly back to taking the time, talking about something that was relevant, uh, as I say, freely sharing information understanding what they were what they were struggling with and, and kind of talking to them not lots of kind of techno babble not talking to them like a, a PhD student talking to them like somebody who can actually help solve their issues yeah and that's where our education started and that that continues to be although we do that differently now through weekly webinars and open that up to a much bigger audience that is the single biggest way and, and successful way of building trust and ultimately becoming more commercially successful and and i hope that if uh you know the last year has taught us anything that those businesses trying to climb out of out of the hole they found themselves in is that education plays a bigger part in 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 helping our our economy recover and and decarbonizing you know this massive issue that we've got about decarbonizing the uk um get there faster the only way you can do that is by using the network effect and sharing what you know and learning from others who know something you don't know. So with that, that's always been a a strategy from the business from the start. And we've continued it because it is so successful in, in ultimately us doing, doing work with, with others. And what, what are the sorts of things that you're, you're cover? Can you be able to give us an example of the sorts of things? Yes. So a presentation I've done literally hundreds of times. This was one of my stock kind of presentations was, was simply an introduction to renewable technology. So um, that was a presentation that covered, you know, what is an air source heat pump? What is a ground source heat pump? How can you collect energy from the ground? You know, you've got boreholes, horizontal collectors, collecting energy from water. You know, where does biomass boilers fit into that? Uh, Solar PV panels, home battery systems. And this was kind of, you know, five five minutes on each of those technologies um, and as I say, that was a that was a standard kind of forty minute presentation, and um, you know that's some pretty basic stuff. We're not we're not talking about you know needing lots of experience, and we're not talking about how to you know do pipe sizing and those kinds of things. But mm. it was an idea of what technologies are replacing LPG, uh, you know, gas, oil, electric storage heaters, and that was that was fascinating to enough 
practices just to get their foot in the door. Yep. That, that, I, I did that so, so many times. But as I say, the last year, we, we've seen a massive evolution in, in what we've been doing. So we were doing, uh, you know, some, some pretty basic stuff like that pretty, pretty often. Um, but, but now every week, you know, we've got guest architects on our webinars talking about post-occupancy evaluation, you know, light touch, what happens at the end? You know, so you've built the sustainable buildings. How, how do you measure how well that's done? How do you compare that to what you thought would happen at the beginning? You know, we're covering off uh, the REBA 2030 climate framework. Mm-hmm. Case studies are always a, a really interesting one, you know, to see sustainability actually designed and, and in action. Uh, and, and so we've really opened the, opened the book on that. But most importantly, listen to people who have come to those sessions and they tell us what they're what they're after. Probably a bit like you, Rion. You know, you 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 understand what your audience is after, and then you create content for that, and that leads to a, a far more engaged and uh, audience and and far richer content. Where, where did where did that approach of webinars begin from? Uh, necessity. Uh, we we did. I, I reckon until the first of April last year. Uh, it was the end of March, wasn't it? When when the UK kind of had the first lockdown. Yep. I'd done two webinars. I'd done one to a practice in Manchester and one, and that was because of physical location. Right. Location. And then there was another one in, uh, whether it was up north somewhere or maybe it was in Scotland, I can't remember, but um, it was so weird, but, you know, it's such a, such a bizarre format because people weren't really bought into kind of doing webinars. Um, and so when we, when I physically wasn't allowed to go and see people, you know, as I say, this was a really important um, way of reaching out to new practices. We just thought, well, look, you know, let's just give it a go. Um, we understand, we understood that consistency was the aim of the game. You know, once a week wasn't a big deal. I had a mm-hmm. of maybe five or six presentations so I could get a month and a half without having to write any new content. And, and we just started doing it. And, and you know, so we, we, it was very much a necessity thing. But as people got more familiar with Zoom and we created some quality content, funny enough, people shared it. You know, we, we shouted about the fact that we were doing it. And I think that consistency has, has really, really helped. So when we were, were, were first doing it, you know, I probably got 20 people to a, to, to a session, which, which wasn't half bad, given the fact that yeah. I started it from scratch. But, you know, now, now we're almost consistently, you know, in, in triple figures. So, you know, that is we're never going to go back to doing it the old way. You know, that has, that has changed now for, for the better. And, you know, we've had people on from India, Australia, you know, Asia, all, all around the world on, on the calls. And, and it just goes to show that everybody, um, it's not just a UK problem, right? This is a, this is a global thing. And, and people are happy to digest, you know, decent information wherever, wherever they're sat on the planet. And, and what are the sorts of, I mean, can you give us an example of how you work with an architect? So say, let's say that you do get brought in kind mm-hmm. of pre-planning or feasibility stage right at the early parts yeah. of the projects. What sorts of um, services are you, are you providing and how does it, how, how is it enhancing the, uh, the architectural vision? Yeah, sure. Well, the best way to do it is, is kind of tell it a, a bit like a story from those early stages. You know, we, um, we, we can do bespoke bits of consultancy, you know, dip in, dip out, but, but by far and away, the, 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 the most value that architects get out of it is by, by doing it in, in bigger chunks rather than kind of bitty piecemeal fashion. So, for example, if, uh, say, if architects wanted to contact us and they had an initial design together and maybe they had, you know, they, maybe let, let's take the, the REBA 2030 framework just as an example. So, they, they had talked to the client. The client was keen to be to do something around sustainable. There may be some local planning, um, you know, requirements. It might be, I don't know, a 10% carbon reduction or something that the, the project's got to do. That, that's increasingly um, popular. But, but the architects themselves wanted to do something a bit more. So say they wanted to do, to do REBA 2025 or we'll get to that level on the, on the framework. And they had a design together we could at the very first stages there, not only kind of talk to them about the scheme and what the aspirations were and what the targets had been set were, Mm -hmm. but actually um, benchmark the design in the first place. So one of the big issues is here, and and we've identified this working with hundreds of architects, is sustainability is fine, 
but you need to put it in context. You know, having, you know, Briam, Reba 2030, you know, the well standard, all these kinds of things, that, that, that means something to the design. Right. And so at those early stages, being able to benchmark where you are against the, these various targets is, is absolutely critical. And that's something which architects, again, are, are learning. So we can, at the very first instance, jump in and increasingly we're putting together a very, very affordable kind of building physics model. So really using cutting edge technology, not just an Excel spreadsheet. Oh, you, you know, you're approximately here, you're approximately there. This, there's so many interrelated things here. We can help at those early stages, just benchmarking, light touch analysis, just benchmarking the design. And as you go into stage three and kind of start to build up for planning, um, we can develop that design. You can understand where the weaker elements of it are. The strong ones, you can start thinking about energy strategies. So, okay, well, in order to deliver against this standard, I don't know, you might be thinking about a heat pump. Well, okay, how big does it need to be? How much does it cost? Are there any subsidies? Now, again, you, you might you might not do the whole, the whole shooting match running up to that point, but you're getting more of an idea. You're answering questions as they come up, not just hoping that when you get through planning, the MEP consultant is going to be able to answer them all. And the benefit here for architects is, as I say, is keeping risk down, making sure that you're not wandering off on some kind of tangential path compared to where you're supposed to be getting to. Mm. But it tells an increasingly more robust story for planning. So sustainability comes more important. If you've actually analysed the project in some way, shape or form, um, you know, there's, a, there's some numbers there, some hard numbers. There is, there is actual some real meat behind the sustainability aspect of the project. Yeah. But we understand that the client, you know, isn't going to throw endless amounts of money before planning, but it allows you to in, in, improve the, or, or should I say, reduce the design risk and improve the story before you get to planning. Once you get through planning, you have that peace of mind, you're on the right track. But now, because you've been given permission, um, we can then start getting into the detailed design, refining those final bits and pieces on the design. And as a service, in order to continue the story here, we can start designing systems. So we now offer a full MEP design package. So that's everything from heating, hot water, ventilation, you know, car charging points, heat pump design, anything that you can imagine, above ground drainage, below ground drainage, the list goes on and on and on. So again, you carry that sustainability story through a robust package of works through to tender specification. And that's really helping the architects out because you can get away from these kind of generic, oh, this house is going to have a heat pump. And then you go out to installers and then you get all kinds of numbers and specifications and, and designs back. So you, you're very much, the architects have still got control over the specification of the project. Right. And increasingly, we, we help um, find specialist installers, review the tenders coming back. So again, you're taking that load off the architect's mind. You're still giving the client choice. And, and you're shaking out the prices to make sure that you're getting you know, competitive quotes for the right things. Uh, and then we can help through construction at key design meetings uh, and, and help get, we help a lot of people get government subsidy at the end of the project. So when the system has been commissioned, there's still tens and tens of thousands of pounds available from the government for doing that. So, so we're able to help with all those kinds of so that that's that's quite interesting then so uh, as a as a service that you're able to, if you're able to kind of demonstrate that you can get government subsidies subsidies at the end of the project that kind of mm. offsets in a way kind of in terms of in terms of fees and upfront costs and yeah yeah i mean in in most cases in most cases just being able to get that government subsidy at the end pays for off <laughs> pays for our fees right the, the whole the whole project and, and i think this is a this is a big kind of misnomer because whilst i think a lot of architects will be familiar with um kind of mep consultants or mechanical and electrical electrical design consultancy to have all of those things that i talked about to have all that confidence to reduce the risk to give yourself peace of mind to show the client that you've more got more control over the sustainability aspects of the project mm -hmm. um, really is very little extra cost on top of your your traditional fees so it, it shouldn't this stuff does not break the bank but there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits as a result got it um and, and in terms of commercial clients what what do you find the main difference between your residential clients and commercial clients are there is i and this is obviously a massively sweeping statement i yes. think 
for for domestic clients, there's a lot more passion and available money for sustainable aspiration. Right. I think, you know, they're not looking at, not all clients anyway, are looking at, you know, return on investment and, and pinching every single penny, you know, particularly, you know, when you're building bespoke homes, you know, these may be homes for the, the rest of somebody's life, you know, funnily enough, they have life savings, they have an idea of what it want to look like, and, and they're, they're a lot more kind of flexible and a lot more passionate about what they're trying to do. When you think about it commercially, invariably, you have budgets, um, you know, you, you've got, you, you that you're trying to make sure that your you, you know your your services are uh, you know not too not too OTT. There's still value there, but you probably mm. go to the same level of detail. But again, you know, bizarrely, as your buildings get bigger, the, the risks just just elevate like you wouldn't believe. You know, to be to be out by a, a bit on a single house is completely different. Being out by a bit with a massive block of flats or a school or a you know a, a manufacturing complex. So, you know, and, and I think commercially, yes, there's a lot more regulation commercially. You know, you've got Briam is, is a pretty classic example. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that is, is quite, quite bureaucratic, Briam, really very, very expensive. Um, and I think there's some, some more work to be, to, be, to be done to make sure that sustainability and, and commercial properties and, and, and premises can you know, kind of happily go into the, go into the future and, and, and do a, do a great job of that. Um, but it, it's, yeah, th- th- there are some, there are some different pressures there commercially, particularly from developers. Yeah. Developers have got to go a long, long way to understanding the benefits of sustainable. Well, the, the, this, is, this, this is inter- an interesting conversation that comes up a lot in the industry. And obviously architects are very, um in on the whole i would say and you know as, as an industry very very keen to be implementing sustainable solutions to buildings and yeah. you know typically we have a, a long sort of lifespan thought for our for our architecture but yet for clients it's a lot it can be a lot more difficult and the commercial clients may often see sustainability design as a kind of upfront cost and it's harder to see the kind of the long-term value of it so how do you yeah how do you kind of navigate that or help architects navigate the the selling of sustainability how do we sell sustainability yeah i i think it's a so so in in essence what you're saying is there's there's more stick you know developers and and commercial clients need to be prodded from the rear end rather than some some do (laughs) (laughs) yeah exactly I think you know. You know, it's funny that there's a lot changing. There's going to there's going to be a lot changing in the next twelve months and and, and beyond. So, um, I mean, to answer to answer this, the, the question specifically, when I start talking to developers and commercial clients, there, there's a couple of angles here, and it and it completely depends how invested that person is. You, you know, what, what in in their mind, how much they believe in sustainability. If you've got somebody who is very very cynical about it somebody who is very, very, uh, you know, doesn't have a budget for sustainability and they will do it if they absolutely have to, then you can start talking to them about the compliance side. You know, you, you're never going to be able to run away from, uh, you know, a planning condition that says, right, you know, you've got to build this to Brian right. very good or outstanding. And that, you know, that will only get more difficult, you know, Building regulations is changing in the next 12 months to include for uh, if you've got developers who are doing domestic dwellings, you know, 30% carbon reduction on today's today's building regulations. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, that is a big, big leap. So reducing the carbon emissions of that dwelling by 31% within the next five years, 80%. So, you know, that, that stick is getting longer and pointier for, the, for these guys. And... They certainly any any development takes time to go through and, and jump through all the hoops. So those guys need to be thinking about that today in order to make sure that they're not having to scrabble around when they, they, they're getting a develop done. So you can come at you can come at that angle. Right. We're a bit more cynical. You know, com- compliance and regulation is is changing one way, and they can either get ahead of that and understand it, or put their businesses at risk. And that they you know, and, and and cost them money further on down the line. If you've got more engaged developers or, or more engaged commercial clients, the, the angle that we would think about or, or encourage suggesting is 
is one of looking at the the marketing potential for you know people who are going to rent houses live in houses um rent office space you know let, let's take offices for example you know yeah. health, healthy work environment now as people do at least in some part come back to working in you know high-rise offices you know ventilation quality um you know biophilic design you know having plants like the ones behind me in that space you know people care about this stuff more so it, it, and, and it has been proven that, that there's been reports done that you can charge more rent. Uh, you know, they're more desirable. You're going to be able to sell stuff off plan far, far quicker. And, and that right. goes for both housing and um, housing and commercial premises. Um, and, and that, I think, if you've got a client who is already can, can see those, these, see those advantages and improve their marketing as a result, um, that, you know, that's super duper encouraging. I think more people, once you see, sustainable buildings getting ahead of the ones that aren't sustainable then the numbers make a difference if right. you can 10 percent more rent if you can fill your portfolio you know six months before your competition can do then then developers are going to start changing direction because they can see a financial benefit and it does their brand some good you know, yeah. you know developers some have great branding some some don't but sustainability will soon be a must have not a nice to have do, do you have a lot of kind of post-occupancy data, if you like, that kind of demonstrates the the quantitative aspects of performance on on buildings and the kind of money savings that it can make in terms of in terms of bills and costs like that that you can kind of effectively demonstrate to a client and say, look, this is how much money it's going to be saving over the over the long run. Yeah, honestly, um, honestly, no. There's not a there's not a wealth of information out there. Uh, not least because there is still um, resistance from from clients to to doing that. There's a, there's a couple of things to say here. One is mm. at, unless you factor in some kind of a budget, and it doesn't have to be a big budget for post occupancy evaluation. It right, be a tiny tiny amount. You know, by the time you get to the end of a project and you're trying to do that, all the money's been spent and probably more money's been spent than the client was was hoping for so you meet a lot of resistance but actually there's there's a big there is still a big issue from architects who don't really understand what they need to do i think when the when post occupancy evaluation is talked about um i think people can see the merits of learning from you know <laughs> learning from what they've designed people think man you know does that mean I've got to put 10 sensors in every single room? What am I going to do with this data that's kind of streaming into my <laughs> It's going to mean nothing to me. I, I, that's not who I am. I, I'm a creative kind of a, a guy or a girl. That, that's, that's going to be way beyond me. And, and, and so they don't see the value we're, we're actually when you think about the practical terms, as well as trying to convince the client that all this stuff needs to be done. And so I think, again, coming back to education, there is – understanding what light touch post-occupancy evaluation means, um, but at the same time, having a solid model. I've talked about this kind of building physics model idea, which we're increasingly rolling out on more projects. So as long as you can keep that more cost efficient, you, you've got a really intelligent model there that even if you get just something as simple as looking at some of these energy bills, mm. you know, you, you haven't got to measure their electricity usage every five seconds, but understanding what their three month um, heating bill was. Um, so in, it's in, in the heating season tells you if you're anywhere close to what was predicted. And so th there's a few things to be done here, but there is not a load of information for those reasons because there's been a lot of resistance historically. And even if somebody decides they're going to do it on a project, it could be a year away from completion, six months away from completion, and then you've got that data gathering. There's a lot more information commercially, but, but next to nothing really domestically. It's, re it's really interesting because, you know, as from a marketing perspective, you know, marketeers are going to say, if you can get this data, it's really useful to have it. And, you know, it's going to help kind of make the point and sell and sell upfront these kinds of sustainability services. And then there's in the, in, in the architecture industry kind of post, we talk about it a lot, but the actual pragmatics of delivering on post occupancy analysis is, as you're saying, it's not easy. It's not straightforward. no. But it should be, I, I think technology will help in this respect. So a bit right. more understanding from the from the architects, but technology will help. I mean, you know, we've got, whether we like it or not, we've got data coming out of our ears. 
Um, it, it's just how to interpret that data mm. um, and, and, and just keeping the pressure up and understanding that that's a necessary part of building design. It may be one of the last things that you do, but it's the, pre, it's the precursor to the next design that you do. Um, and, 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 you know, once you can get people's heads around that, then you just small discussions turn into bigger discussions then practical discussions and then discussions on cost. And then how you're going to, you know, understand and, and communicate that to, to the client. I mean, I would say, you know, again, the ROBA have made a, a move last year. Um, just saying you can't enter the Sterling Prize Awards, for example. That's a classic example. Right. So you now cannot enter the Sterling Prize Award unless you have post-occupancy evaluation data. And again, that, that's a way of, of, of raising the bar and, and, and making people sit up and, and take note. Because again, you know, practices who are trying to make a name for themselves and win awards, that's a, that's a barrier to entry. Yeah. But, it, but it's one that can be, can be easily overcome. You've mentioned a few times your the, the building physics model that you implement. Could you tell us a little bit more about what that is and how it works? Yeah, so this is um, this is something we use a program called IESVE, which is a very very big um, you know, global commercial program. But in, in very very simple terms, it, it, it's a uh, a bit like you you guys or your listeners would would build a three D model in in Revit or SketchUp or you know Auto Autodesk all those kind of things. Um, you've got, it's very, very similar, but it's actually quite basic. So probably the, the most akin is something like a SketchUp model. So you've got mm. the elements, you've got windows, you've got doors, you've got, you know, your roof, roof form and, you know, various elevations. And what you do is um, it, it's relatively quick to, to, to build it. And, and there's a piece of software that allows you to do that, or you can import certain bits of geometry into this interface. But you basically overlay onto that your U values, um, and as a result, you get thermal mass information. You orientate it like you would do a, a 3D model. So you right. get the daylighting effects, solar gains, and you turn something which is otherwise just a beautiful looking architectural model into something which is far more useful because you've, as the name suggests, you've got the effect that thermal mass has, you've got the effect that solar gain has, and you can interrogate the model at any given minute of any given day of any time of the year in whatever location around the globe. And as I say, the, the technology has moved on to such a point now that in most cases, you could have a fully working model in a, in a single day's worth of consultancy effort doing that. Right, amazing. So we're talking about, you know, high three-figure, low four-figure sums of money to, to build that. But the, the magic of that is, yes, that's an investment, and an upfront investment to do that. But it, it, I've used this analogy of this kind of hub and, hub and spoke effect. So rather than just doing linear design, you know, the architect does their bit and then they pass it on to the structural engineer and then the structural engineer passes on to the renewable energy consultant and then the builder. Yeah. You know, we've got to think far more circular here. And this allows you to have a, a model which you can interrogate, improve, iterate and, and, and better the design against these sustainability criteria as well. And uh, so once you've made that initial upfront investment, making small tweaks is very, very cost effective. And we are finding that I think once people and, and, and architects and design teams understand that that's part of the toolkit and it doesn't cost a fortune to do, it, it makes complete sense because you can't get that feedback. Yes. Away. And, and one of the things that I would say, uh, and I've said this many, many times before, but important for, for, the, for people listening to this is experience now means less and less and less and the reason is is because we are innovating and changing the built environment so rapidly mm. software has to play an increasing part in you know joining all these interrelated multidisciplinary things together uh you know and and, and bim is a is a, you know a, you know, building integrated and modeling is, is used more and more for bigger commercial projects and and this is the kind of effect that you're getting at, at, at a smaller scale. I mean, you can use it at any scale, but having this kind of centralized model that you can interrogate is the most efficient, most effective, and most successful way of, of moving designs forward. Brilliant. And if architects um, are interested in, in working with you, how would, how would, what's the best way for them to get in, in contact? Yeah, a couple of ways. I mean, the, 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 the best way is to um, hit up the website. So that's mesh-energy.com. 
we've got all kinds of resources there. Uh, you know, tells you in, in detail what we're what we're up to, shows you who's in the who, who's in the team. And, uh, and, and other than that, uh, we've got a YouTube channel, which has got tons of uh, webinar and educational information on oh, it. Brilliant. Visit the Mesh Energy YouTube channel. Again, we've got links from the website. So probably the best place to do is, is visit the website, have a look around. We're always available on the phone or, or email uh, and always open to, to starting a conversation and just, just saying hi. Fantastic. Doug, I think that's probably a, an excellent place for us to conclude. And thank you so much for sharing your insights and how you work with, with architects. And I think this is an, a really valuable um, service and you know a, a partnership, really, of how you work with, with architects. And obviously, this is something that's so, like so many architects now are just kind of on a drive and on a mission to be able to integrate sustainability and make sure that our designs are as... Um, you know, harmless as possible. Yeah, great. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and and using the word partnership there is is really really key. Um, I, I think there's you know be be great to use our experience to help uh, you know help help more and more designs out and help more and more teams learn and you know have a great experience the first you know through a sustainable project that they do. So uh, yeah, thanks very much for having me on, Rian. My pleasure. Thank you. No worries. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.